As the US struggles to contain the impact of COVID-19, would it be better off with a European-style lockdown? Hello, Anna. Welcome. Hello, Tim. Thanks for having me. Now, Anna, I live in London, so I'm under lockdown. I haven't been further than a supermarket in weeks. So, in general, how do we evaluate the, the sort of benefits that a lockdown like this achieves? So, the benefits of a lockdown come from preventing people from meeting a large number of other people and passing on the virus. So as it happens, fewer people will get sick and fewer people will die before the pandemic eventually ends due to vaccinations and herd immunity. So that's really the benefit of a lockdown. And you make a, a, a cost benefit calculation on lockdowns I, I, in this paper. And in your calculation, what do you consider to be the costs of a lockdown? So in my paper, I consider the costs of a lo lockdown coming strictly from the reduction in economic activity. So because a lockdown will cause some businesses to close and some uh, workers in those businesses are not going to be able to work remotely, there will be um, a lower GDP as a result. So this reduction in GDP due to fewer people working and also perhaps in some estimations, one could put people homeschooling their children because the schools might be closed. So this lower productivity will lead to a lower GDP. And I combine estimates from three different papers and I estimate the cost of a lockdown incremental to the reduction of the economic activity that's already happening because people are socially distancing anyway. So I estimate this cost to be roughly 36 billion per week. Gosh, and what do you measure as the benefits of a lockdown? The benefits of a lockdown come from the reduction in the number of infections and the number of deaths until the time that the pandemic eventually comes to an end. So really the benefits come from three sources. With fewer people getting sick, uh, they're not missing work due to illness, so they were not missing this productivity of people who are sick or taking care of their relatives who are sick. In addition, we are not going to have as many deadweight medical costs um, on treating the ill that could have gone to elsewhere to treat people ill with other medical conditions. And finally, the biggest component is the value of life that we're losing uh, when people are dying. How do you measure the value of a human life in this calculation? Yeah, that's a good question. There are different ways to measure value of life. And no matter what's the way, they're going to be controversial. So when I worked in the government, it was very common to measure the value of life with the value of statistical life. So this is a measure that is estimated empirically from people's preferences. So all of us would prefer not to die and we would be willing to pay money to stay alive. So people who work in riskier jobs, for example, are paid more than people who work in less risky jobs, such as construction workers are get, getting paid more than retail workers. In addition, we are typically willing to invest in protective equipment, such as bike helmets, um, and we're willing to pay for the cost of medical interventions for ourselves and our children so that everybody can stay alive. So we could actually estimate the value of life for those, uh, from those preferences. Uh, the other method that I used is the quality adjusted life years. So this method looks at how many years of life you have left and assigns a value between zero and one to the quality of those years. If you're in perfect health, then the quality of your life is one, the highest that it can be. If you die, then the quality of life is zero. And if you are in a less than perfect health, it's somewhere between zero and one. And um, then it just sums up across all the life years that you have remaining times the quality of those years. So with this method, somebody who is older, they have a lower life expectancy than somebody who is younger. And those years that they have remaining are in less than perfect health. So automatically you get a much lower value of life for somebody who is older than for somebody who is younger. So let me just uh, put some numbers on it. So with VSL, somebody who is middle-aged, their life is valued at about 
10 million versus somebody who is over 65 years old, their value of life is 5.3 million. With qualies, somebody who is middle aged, the value of life is 8 million if you put it on the same basis. And somebody who is over 65, their value of life is only 4 million. So if I use the dollar value per quality that the insurance industry is using, it's actually going to be lower than that. And somebody in the insurance industry will value the life of somebody over 65 years old at only 1.4 million. So with the COVID pandemic, obviously because it affects much more the older population, when they use qualities, the value of the lives that we lose is going to be much lower than if I use VSL to value life. Whichever method you use to value a life, at what point in your model does it become right to lift a lockdown? So in my model, I estimate, so with the assumptions on the speed of vaccinations that I use in the paper, that assumes that 70% of the population will be vaccinated by June, I estimate that the lockdown should be kept in place between two and four weeks. Two weeks when I use the slower value of life that I calculate from qualities, and four weeks when I calculate the value of life using VSL. And how confident can we be about the sorts of numbers that you're putting into the model, the dangers of COVID-19 and what's going to happen in the future? Those statistics, how well do we know them now? So we actually had know quite a lot about the strains that were prevailing up until now. You know, of course, there's some uncertainty about the new strains, the UK strain and the South African strain. So maybe we would actually have to get new data and estimate um, new infection fatality ratios and uh, the reproduction number for this virus. But with the virus that was prevailing for a long time, there are actually quite a lot of estimates on the infection fatality ratio and on the reproduction number. There are a number of papers that I have read in the medical literature, and a lot of those papers are the analysis of the already published papers, and they pretty much agree on what those um, inputs into the models should be. But I also do some sensitivity analysis where I use the more conservative assumptions than those, what those papers estimated. Now, you call the paper, could the U.S. benefit from a lockdown? So well, what is the question? What would be the right policy for the U.S. right now? So right now, we should impose a lockdown, according to my paper, as soon as possible and keep it in place for up to four weeks. So that would be the right policy right now. And what will be the net benefits of that? So I estimate that the net benefits of that will be uh, about 1.2 trillion, which is the benefit of the lives saved, of illnesses prevented, minus the costs associated with the reduced GDP from a lockdown. So that's about 6% of GDP. It's a non-negligible number. Now you've used the, the most obvious uh, impacts of locking down or not locking down in the model, but there are others that are discussed a lot at the moment. For example, the environment or the impact on our, our mental health. Might factoring that change the optimality of a lockdown or the length of it? This is a great question because as I was uh, researching lockdowns, I saw that there's a lot of new literature that emerged in environmental science, in the medical literature, on analyzing the impacts of the spring lockdowns in the US and around the world. And this literature actually finds that there are obviously some additional costs of a lockdown, but there are also a lot of benefits that I think I did not really anticipate ex ante. So for example, with the reduced mobility, reduced number of cars on the streets, there are fewer fatalities, traffic fatalities, fewer traffic injuries. So in general, there's a paper that analyzed the effect of a lockdown in New Zealand, and it uh, found that the mortality actually decreased. So a big part of it is that they think that there was less infections, fewer infections with seasonal flu, fewer deaths from seasonal flu, fewer on-the-job accidents. And other papers find that there's an improved air quality so there's fewer deaths and emergency room visits from 
asthma and different medical conditions related to the poor air, air quality. Um, there's also surprisingly, there's some evidence from Germany that there's a lower number of suicides. And there's one paper that looks at Massachusetts. It also found that during this time, there was, there was a lower number of suicides, even though that was not statistically significant in Massachusetts. And the speculation is that when people get to spend more time with their families, or when people don't have to drive to work, perhaps, you know, in some ways their mental condition improves. But that said, there's also evidence in the UK from the survey data saying that people feel more anxious and more depressed because of a lockdown. So the effect of a lockdown on mental health is ambiguous, I would say. And we've also heard about the impacts on domestic violence on one hand and crime on the other as well. Right. So this is also the fact uh, that crime has gone down. There was a UN study that found that crime has gone down around the world during the lockdown because there were fewer opportunities to commit crime. But domestic violence instances may have increased. So the effect is ambiguous there. Now, we've used so far your work to talk about what should happen now, today, right next thing to do. Can we use your model and sort of wind back time and guess what might have been the impact of a lockdown if it had been imposed in the U.S. Uh, March, April last year, around the time that European countries were locking down? Right. So I think we could definitely use this model, but um, there are also a number of papers that look at different states. Some actually imposed stay-at-home orders and quite strict lockdowns. Others didn't. So there are papers actually looking at that in the U.S. and what happened in the spring. And those papers um, say that those uh, strict uh, restrictions in some states, they actually did prevent a large number of deaths. So one of such papers is Gustavo Schwenkler and his co-authors. Aaron Yelovitz and his co-authors have another paper in health affairs that look precisely at that. Now, you've been in the room when policies made. You live in the U.S. Uh, for those of us who don't, why is it that a national lockdown is never seriously discussed in the U.S. ever? I think I would say it's because it is really a federalist system. So the federal government cannot really tell states what to do. So maybe it can give some guidance and suggestions, but it's really up to individual states to decide what they want to do. And so this is what happened in the spring. Some states imposed very strict restrictions and others did really next to nothing. But with a new regime in charge and a change in policies towards dealing with coronavirus and perhaps a more facts-driven agenda, you're measuring the benefits in the trillions. Is there a chance that things might change? There might be a national lockdown in response to COVID-19 or whatever the next pandemic is in the US? Yeah, this is really a good question. So I think before it is even considered seriously, we need to establish more of a safety net. So the CARES Act and CARES 2 Act is coming to an end soon. And uh, the Biden administration is trying to pass the new COVID relief bill that will establish the safety net for people who end up losing their jobs and businesses that suffer. So perhaps after that, such uh, a decision may be considered, but it will be some time from now. And uh, actually, I sent my paper to Biden's COVID task force. I don't know. Maybe they are thinking about it. Maybe not. I think politically, it will be really difficult to do that just because the number of cases is declining. So in my model, I also have the number of cases declining, but it is still beneficial to do that because you will reduce the number of people who die before, every, before there's a herd immunity. But I think politically, it will be very difficult to get public support behind this idea that we need a lockdown. So for now, uh, the Biden administration um, you know, increase the widen the, the face mask mandate and a number of other policies that should help reduce the spread of COVID. I just really personally don't think that we will come to that, that we will have a national lockdown, even with the new administration. 
Well, we'll have to wait and see. I mean, I just always assume that everyone in the Biden administration reads COVID economics, but I could be wrong. We'll find out. But meanwhile, thank you very much, Anna. Thank you, Tim. And the paper's called, Could the United States Benefit from a Lockdown, a Cost-Benefit Analysis? It's in COVID economics 65 we're up to now. You can download it using the short link on the screen now. And remember to keep in touch with all the latest research on COVID-19 in COVID economics. It's free, it's open access at cepr.org.